Good evening and welcome. I am John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Grant Ginder in support of Let's Not Do That Again in conversation this evening with Jillian Medoff. Just a quick uh, webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase the book from Literati throughout the event. Q&A is available to you. Uh, that features on your webinar or on your toolbar of the webinar as well. We encourage you to submit questions at any time, and I will read a selection of your questions at the conclusion of Jillian and Grant's conversation this evening. Live transcription is also available to you should you need that on your toolbar using the CC icon. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below us. You can also subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events once they become available on our channel and as a reminder you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the united states and if you live in southeast michigan our doors or in ann arbor our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping but most of all we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning, or this afternoon, or much later this evening, depending on when and where in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author, who will be reading uh, following my introduction and our interlocutor. Grant Kinder is the author of five previous novels, including The People We Hate at the Wedding, which has been adapted into a major motion picture, starring Allison Janney. Kirsten Bell and Ben Platt. Originally from Southern California, Ginder received his MFA from New York University, where he teaches writing. And joining him after his reading and conversation, Jillian Medoff is the author of four acclaimed novels, This Could Hurt, I Couldn't Love You More, Good Girls Gone Bad, and Hunger Point, Hunger Point. Uh, sorry, Hunger Point was made into an original cable movie starring Christina Hendricks and Barbara Hershey, directed by Joan Micklin Silver. Her fifth novel, When We Were Bright and Beautiful, is forthcoming from Harper in August, so you can pre order it from literatibookstore.com as well if you'd like. Please join me in welcoming Jillian Medoff and Grant Ginder into your living rooms. Uh, thank you, John. And thank you, Literati, thank you. for having us. And thank you, Jillian, for joining me. And thank you for thank people you so who joined us for, for spending your, your Friday night with us. I have I have a drink. I have a Negroni. Um, I hope everyone at home is, is uh, in, enjoying their Friday night, too. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to start off with, um, with just a, a short reading, about a five-minute reading, um, from, from the beginning of, of Let's Not Do That Again. Uh, I'm trying to think of what context you might need to understand it. It's um, it follows Nick, who is the the son of Nancy Harrison, who is running for Senate in New York. Nick used to work for his mother uh, as a speechwriter and a fixer and kind of her her, her right hand man for many years, and he's finally gotten out from from under her thumb to to strike out on his own and start his own life, um, which consists of teaching writing at New York University, which is perhaps not coincidentally what I also do. Um, and Nick is also working on a musical based on the, the early life of Joan Didion that's called Hello to All That. So um, the bit I'm gonna be reading is um, ex explaining how this idea for the Joan Didion musical came to Nick. Um, so yeah, here we go. It was an idea that came to him last fall when his introduction to thinking course, he asked his students to read On Self-Respect, the essay that Didion published in Vogue in 1961, the one that, as he explained to them, really put her on the map. He remembers how, in the minutes before class started, he rolled up his shirt sleeves and smelled the fresh ink on the stack of copies he'd Xeroxed. It was his first day on the job, his first day of life free from the incessant demands of Washington, the country, and his mother, and he was excited. Excited to see minds bloom, to help them untangle the mysteries of the world, to learn. As the clock crept, crept, crept closer to nine o'clock, he polished his glasses and checked his teeth. He sat in his chair and then, thinking better of it, leaned on the edge of his desk instead. One by one, the students filed in, unloading their backpacks and taking seats around the seminar table. How young they looked and how eager. He greeted each of them with a hearty hello. And when they asked him if he was Professor Harrison, he laughed and waved the question away. Professor Harrison was someone who wore tweed jackets and said things like, indubitably, they could call him Nick. 
He didn't bother with the syllabus, the tedious parsing of due dates and attendance policies, the arithmetic of final grades. Instead, he hit him with a bang. He hit him with the Didion. For the first minute, they approached the text timidly, a group of swimmers using their toes to test the temperature of the lake. And then slowly, they began to wade in. So let's start with the big question, he said, once the last student had finished the essay. What is self-respect? At first, crickets the soft creak of weight being redistributed in chairs, and then bingo, a hand. The girl across the table, who by now had tucked her pencil into a loose bun of raven hair, a freshman whose name, a quick glance at Nick's roll sheet revealed, was Vanessa. Yes, he clasped his hands together and pointed at her. Take it away. I actually find this essay to be really problematic. The class stared at Nick. Nick bit his lip. Oh, well, huh. So if you check out the fifth to last paragraph, for example, a flurry of turning pages, raindrops alighting on flat face leaves. She says, people who respect themselves are willing to accept the risk that the Indians will be hostile. Well, right. Okay, well, first of all, it's Native Americans. Okay, that's a fair point. And second of all, hostile from whose perspective? A bunch of smallpox infested white guys who have come to steal their land? Oh, well, I think she was using that as a callback to the paragraph before, where she quotes from the diary of the young pioneer girl. Okay, so the daughter of a smallpox infested white guy who has come to steal their land. Nick scratched his head. It was 1961, he offered, meaning, meaning that maybe they didn't have like the same perspective on that word yet or the same perspective on the brutalities of manifest destiny, evidently, because I hardly think that being a foot soldier in the mass genocide of native peoples calls for a celebration of self-respect, even if you, Vanessa scanned the page, narrowed in on a quote, have the courage of your own mistakes. Someone coughed. Outside, a garbage man collected bags on West 11th Street, hurling them into the yawning rear of a truck. Okay, Nick said. So let's acknowledge that the use of Indians in this paragraph is, as Vanessa said, problematic. Beyond that, though, what is Didion really saying here? What does she mean when she says that we flatter ourselves by thinking this compulsion to please others an attractive trait, a gift for imaginative empathy, evidence of our willingness to give? What does this compulsion to please stand in opposition to self-respect? Vanessa's hand shot up, but Nick pretended he didn't see it. Instead, he directed his attention to a right where a boy with a nose ring was drawing circles in the margins of his paper. A mirror, Nick said. What do you think about this whole compulsion to please? Setting his pen down, a mirror glanced at Vanessa and then at the rest of the class. He seemed nervous, skittish. His glasses slipped and he reached up to straighten them. Uh, you said this was published in Vogue? Yeah, that's right, in 1961. Oh. Oh? Yeah, a mirror blushed. I guess I just find that a little weird. Vanessa nodded vigorously. Nick scratched his neck. Why is that? Well, Vogue is a fashion magazine, right? Well, yes, primarily, but they've also published some of the best. And isn't a fashion magazine mostly concerned with telling women, well, white women, really, how to make themselves appear pleasing to others? Like, isn't that basically why fashion magazines exist? Well, I think that the people who work at fashion magazines might find that's debatable. Amir reached up and twisted his nose ring. I guess all I'm saying is that it seems a little hypocritical to be writing about self-respect for a magazine that I imagine makes a lot of women question their worth. That's all. And so on and so forth and et cetera. For the next hour and 15 minutes, they discussed the essay's troubling allusions to Jordan Baker and its misguided admiration of Chinese Gordon in Khartoum. They discussed the name Chinese Gordon. And they discussed the intellectual privilege of Phi Beta Kappa and the shaming of Kathy and Wuthering Heights and the essay's presumptive and all-encompassing use of we. They discussed Julian English and appointment in Samara in the 19th century and food pair and paper food fair bags, but they never, not even once, discussed self-respect. This was invigorating, but also disappointing. Nick's lesson plan for the next three classes depended upon their reaching at least a vague consensus of what the essay meant. Beyond that, he was curious and genuinely so. What was self-respect? And a sub-question, how does a person know that he has it? Joan said that it was about making, uh, taking one's own measure and making one's own peace. Had Nick done that when he struck out on his own? Had Joan? Is that what she felt when she graduated from Berkeley? Or how about when she won the Prix de Paris and moved to New York? 
He often imagined her boarding that plane, her ticket clutched with both hands, her heart going haywire in her chest. He imagined her walking into Vogue and getting homesick for dry Sacramento summers and riding Run River and meeting John Gregory Dunn. He imagined her falling in love. And as, Nick, and as Nick did so, as he relived those moments that were never really his, something else materialized for him. A rainbow suddenly appearing across a swath of rain scrub sky, an arc, the story of a life, a musical. Joan singing a lament for California, Joan belting in the heart of Herald Square. He didn't know any composers, at least not directly, but this, this was New York, the land of waiters with Juilliard degrees, the mecca of frustratingly underworked talent. After talking to two friends and sending three emails, he had connected with Celeste, a jazz pianist from the Peabody Institute who had abandoned a life of gigs to write jingles for car commercials. They met at a pub near Union Square, a happy hour spot with big square windows through which Nick could see snow gathering on the hoods of cars. He wore a rumpled button down and jeans, Celeste dressed in all black. She remained perfectly still as he explained the project, moving only to take slow, long sips from her Syrah. Around them, the bar began to fill. Wool slacks and iron shirts, black coats hanging from the backs of chairs. Joan Didion, she said. Yeah, that's right. Like slouching toward Bethlehem, Joan Didion. Yeah, that's the one. Slouching was actually my original title. Celeste ran a finger around the room of her glass. Yeah, she said, I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean, it's not for me. Nick took a sip of beer and licked the foam from his lips. This was an outcome for which he had not prepared. Well, I mean, we could workshop it, of course, he said, you know, share a creative vision, all that. We could listen. Celeste raised a hand to stop him. I don't think it's the most compelling subject matter. No offense. Nick looked down. Snow melted on the tips of his shoes. There was literally a musical called Chess, he said. Thank you. That was great. That was so great. And um, one of the reasons that I love that you picked that passage is it shows what a great stylist you are. And I want, I actually did a deep dive into the Grant Ginder, you know, that you're over. And from book to book, and you have captured both on a macro and a micro level, like people in their worst and at their best. And it, you're so funny and so charming. And I love your books. And I want to talk about everything. But first, the big question is, where are we with the movie? And where are you on set? <laughs> and did you meet Annie Murphy? <laughs> well, no, because she's not in it anymore. Um, oh. So, so there was a scheduling conflict with Annie Murphy. Who we're talking about the the, the film for people who hated the wedding, and um, so Kristen Bell is now playing Alice, uh, who was a character that Annie Murphy was originally well, we slated to play. We love her too. Oh my god, she's fantastic. Um, I so they're working really hard on the edits. That's about all I can say. Um, but but it's 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 filmed. It's in post production. Uh, and I, I, I got to go over to the set. Uh, they filmed the entire thing kind of in and around London um, in the fall of last year. And so I got to go over to the set, which was which was really amazing. I'd never been on a movie set so uh, before. I was like shocked by how many people were there. I showed up at like six o'clock in the morning and immediately began apologizing to everyone for making them wake up so early. I was like, I wrote this book that made you wake up so early. Um, okay. And they were all like, get a grip, it's a job. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, so I mean, we're, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm, 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 I'm waiting for more information just like everyone else. Um, but, but the script is really incredible. Uh, the well, the book is really incredible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the Molyneux sisters, who who are the, the genius minds behind Bob's Burgers, wrote the script. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, the director, Claire Scanlon, who is basically directed like every episode of television that you love from every show you love, she directed it. Um, she did an incredible job. The cast, as as you you know, is incredible. So, um, so yeah, it's exciting. It's really exciting. Good. I'm really glad. So yeah. let's get down to... Um, all of the things that I loved about your book and that other people love too. So um, I have these really compelling questions. I, <laughs> but, one of, but one of the things that I, I'm, I'm really um, very, very impressed, and I'm, I mean this 
you know, very, like seriously, the architecture of your book. And by that, I mean how it's put together, how it, you know, the passages, um, the passage of time. And I'm, I'm really curious, did you start, how did you start and how did you, how did it blow out? Like, did you start with an image or an idea and then go that way? Yeah. And so it's actually, it's interesting. I actually started with, um, this is going to make me sound like such a nerd, but I wanted to somehow play on the idea that Henry James novel, The Ambassadors, um, which the, the premise, right, is that someone basically goes to Europe to retrieve a wayward American. Um, it, it unspools in a, in a much different way than, than Let's Not Do That Again, as it, Let's Not Do That Again is, is, is not a, uh, a retelling of The Ambassadors, but it riffs on that idea. Um, you know, going to Europe to pull someone back, which which tons of books do. Um, you know, the talented Mr. Ripley, of course, uh, is is kind of plays with the ambassadors as well. Um, this, so I, I I kind of started with that kernel, and and I was thinking about how to make it, um, how to make it feel contemporary, and and at the same time, this was around 2018, and at the same time, I was, you know, we were in the middle of the Trump administration, and I was watching our democracy. I feel like being challenged from left, right, and center. And so, so, so politics were very much on my mind. And so I was like, I wonder if I could meld those two things. Um, and what if you had, you know, this family that was a very political family and one of them gets kind of drawn to the wrong side of the political spectrum and without giving too much away, gets drawn to the wrong side of the political spectrum, what happens then, right? They, we have to go back and kind of like rest them back. And so that was how it started, um, just the general idea. And in terms of the architecture of the book, that the book itself is divided into five acts. Um, and I just got it in my head really early on, and this often happens with my books, I got it in my head really early on that I really wanted to play with a classic dramatic structure of five acts, right? Where you have like the, the, uh, the beginning, the rising tension, the climax, falling to, right? All of that stuff um, I just wanted to play with. And so... Um, so I, I gave myself five acts and then I was like, all right, how is this story going to work out from there? Um, so I, I, I kind of set the limitation and the structure and the scaffolding to begin with and then then constructed the story around that. Right. Well, it, it works really well and it's very it seems very organic and it's, you know, it's really hard to do. I think really good novels. Um, there's the writing. There's the story and there's the storytelling. And it's like getting that, you, the combination of all three to work together and the gears to really um, move in sync is hard, but you, you really, you mastered it really beautifully. Thank you. Was, Thank you. I didn't know if, we, if I was supposed to give a synopsis of the book before we started talking about I, it. Um, I, I'm not sure I will for anyone who hasn't, who hasn't read it or not a, a synopsis, but I, this is like good practice for me as I start reading these things. Um, but the, the book, I, I, I should have said this before I started reading the book is it, it follows the last chaotic weeks of Nancy Harrison's campaign for Senate. As I mentioned before, she's a Congresswoman in New York. She, she thought she was going to be a shoe in, um, the race is much closer than she expected. And to make matters worse, um, you know, about a month out from election day, a video emerges of her daughter throwing a champagne bottle through the window of a very famous bistro on the Champs Elysees in Paris during an extremist protest. And so Nick, who was trying to get away from this family, is dispatched to try to bring her back. And and, and all hell breaks loose from there. Yes. And what another thing that I really loved is that you have these characters that are in their own separate universes and you really have a very close third person so you inhabit them and then watching them all play out their um you know their own idiosyncrasies against each other it, it, the idea of this family is so big-hearted and the thing about your humor is that it's so it can be very cutting but it can also <laughs> be i mean there's such just such a real humanity and um, so I, you know, I read a lot about, I, I actually, um, I watched your interviews and I, and I, <laughs> I, I really, I, I really think that one of the things that a couple of reviewers have brought up, but I, I, it's very striking is how you take details like the champagne bottle and um, Greta's, her black dress, the one that she's wearing. And each of these 
um, very specific details has a history and you follow it throughout the whole book, right? I mean, the black dress shows up and at the end, it actually has a very poignant, um, very, very moving moment. And I'm, again, I'm, this is just because I'm curious and I'm doing the questions. Do you storyboard <laughs> these kinds of things or like, how do you keep track of all the details? I, I, I don't storyboard them. Um, so it's, it's a little of a mix and match procedure for me. I, when I was writing this book, I was randomly reading like a ton of mysteries, uh, like Agatha Christie style mysteries. Um, I knew I wanted to play with genre a little bit in the book. And so the last, I would say the last third of the book takes on like a a minor like light thriller, kind of, you know, light um, kind of like whodunit, not whodunit, but light thriller aspect. Um, and what I found when I was reading those Agatha Christie books is, you know, it'd be, the pleasure in reading those books isn't seeing a world you know, right? It's not like right. seeing yourself embodied in a character. It's not the reason that we read like literary fiction or anything like that. It's, um, it, it's so much more of like watching inconsequential details suddenly become consequential and i was i was really surprised by just how much i loved that and how right. much pleasure i found in that you know david mitchell also does it in a lot of his novels there's there are these these little details that you kind of follow throughout the novel and um there it, it made it's it's pleasurable right it's fun right. to read and i and my, my 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 goal with this book was i just wanted to write something that was fun and so I um, knew, for example, that there there's a, a, a sword in the novel, without giving too much away, there's a sword in the novel that um, is planted very early on. And mm -hmm. I I told myself, I'm like, all right, this is going to be Chekhov's sword. In the sense, there's a, you know, the Chekhov's gun principle right. in, in, in writing where- Right, because I saw a, all that sword and I'm like, okay, we're going to see this again. But what's yeah. great is how yeah. it never shows up in the way that you think it does. Right, right, right. And so I, I wanted to play with that. Um, and it was another one of those things how I kind of put the constraint of five acts on myself before I wrote the book. I put this constraint on myself of like, all right, there's going to be some details in here that have lives, that yeah. have stories beyond just the characters, but um, you know, have arcs onto themselves. And so I had fun with it. Some of it was, some of it was pre-planned, and then. Other parts were like, you know, I wrote the prologue where Greta is walking through the streets of Paris wearing this Chanel dress. And I just like the image of this, you know, girl right. walking through a protest wearing a Chanel dress and a pair of dirty Adidas sneakers. And I was like, when I then later on in the book, there was an opportunity to kind of introduce a piece of clothing. And I was like, oh, I'm going to make it, I'm going to bring in the Chanel dress here and right. we're going to bring it back. And so kind of I'm going to give it a life. Um, right. And so, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it, it's just such a, it's really, it reflects like your novelistic instincts. I mean, it's, it's totally organic and, and it, it feels very right. And I felt that way too about your comedy where you're very funny. Um, wow. you. And, you know, even just throwaway lines, you know, you, you really embody the characters and, and I, ha I have a couple um, this, you know, this, this really, uh, there's this throwaway character, okay? And I was just like, oh my God, she's like a wholly, fully formed, you know, she's a fully formed person. A girl with a head two sizes too big for her own body, a plate of untouched green curry sits between them right alongside the girl's Monster Energy Zero Ultra Drink, a red spiral brown notebook and a copy of Nancy's book. And I'm like, oh my God, I see that girl. That could be my kid, you know? I, I, it's, it's, it's really great. I, um, Thank you. I, yeah, I, I, I love it. I, and I think this book, um, I've been watching in the ether. It's getting so much response. People are, are really loving it. In fact, I was just, I have like four followers on Facebook and I, <laughs> um, I posted about our event tonight. Honest to God, I'm not making this up. One of the women that I've known for years because we work together she said, I read it and I loved it. I swear oh, to God. God. <laughs> and she's in the Midwest somewhere in one of those <laughs> states, right? One so I'm states. like, I'm telling you, it, <laughs> from your perspective in, you know, New York, the 
rest of the world or the you know the country let's okay let's take it out, <laughs> take but the it country down. is reading it and loving it so how does that uh, i hope so no, they know, are. i don't i mean you you um you know this as as as, as well as i do that that these, they're very, publishing a book is a very bewildering process. Um, there is this huge ramp up, right? Where you're kind of like yes. running up this ramp. And then I, 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 I you know, think of Wiley e. Coyote running off a cliff, right? Yeah. And it's like so much energy, so much energy, so much energy. And then you're suddenly in midair and right. you're like looking around you and you're like, I have no idea what's happening. There's no ground under my feet. I have right. no idea if anyone is reading this or enjoying it or not. Um, and but the not only, only thing- that, like thousands of people are watching you flop, right? right? <laughs> it, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's a brutal process because I don't know about you, but as a writer, I'm not, writing and publishing are two completely separate events, right? I mean, they're completely separate events. And so, but you know, you've been so, you've been handling it so well. I just need to tell the audience here, if they don't know, <laughs> that um, you were on Good Morning America being interviewed by like George Stephanopoulos. And how was that? I mean, it was wild. It was totally. You were totally so cool, though. You were you wild. Were great. I was in a fugue state. I was. I like literally was the like. Early? I. It was yeah yeah. I mean, the, the segment was at like eight forty five, and I had to get there, and you know, at like seven twenty, and then and then and then this is a funny story about it all. The um, you know, they didn't because of COVID. GMA is is no longer. They're not doing like hair and makeup in the studio for guests. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 like my hair is very short. I didn't care about that. I like, didn't even really think, think about the makeup. I was like, oh, all right. Um, but then I told a friend of mine who is, who's been on the Today Show a few times. So I was like, yeah, they're not doing makeup and whatever. And he like stopped dead in his tracks and was like, you have to find a way to get makeup put on you. And I was like, oh, come on, I don't. And he was like, no, really Grant, going on Good Morning America without makeup was like something that would happen to Liz Lemon. Like you, like you have to do this. And so like, I found this service that would come over to my house like five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning and put makeup on me. And so the whole thing was just this like out of body experience. Um, right. They were really wonderful. And and George Stephanopoulos has been um, such a, a wonderful champion of the book and and um, has had some very nice things to say about it. He like, he like left me an Amazon review, which was like, I was like, what? Uh, it was like so bizarre. <laughs> See like George Stephanopoulos and then like an Amazon review. And so, like, Did you get him on like, Goodreads? Which was, I know I got to get him on Goodreads, right? I, um, which was, which was really sweet um, and, and, and very generous, but it was, a, it was a total out of body experience. Um, you right. know, there were people I hadn't, I hadn't spoken to in years who like, I were suddenly texting me being like, did I see you on Good Morning America? Um, but I was like, yeah, you did. Uh, but it was, but it no, was, but it was you were cool. so great. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I sent it to my mom. Cause I don't know if you remember, but you and I met for the, our, our viewing audience, Grant and I met on the internet. And a third party, a, a woman who's very um, well-known author, somehow the three of us had lunch together. It was one of these yeah. weird internet meetings. Yes. And yes. it was really lovely. Really it was great. lovely. We had a blast. We went to this very expensive place. And I just looked at Grant and I'm like, okay, we're gonna split an appetizer. Because <laughs> we're like in New York City. But it was yeah. so expensive. And I was well, like, and oh we my God. very clearly could not afford it. Right. <laughs> she <Right>. very clearly. <laughs> but uh. Since then, we've been friends. And I remember yeah. when you told me we went out for dinner, you told me that you were going to write a book about a senator. Now, I didn't know anything about your background. And I'm, I was like, uh, yeah, okay, sure you are. <laughs> and then I saw that you had um, interned. And you had all this background, or you were a speechwriter, right? You wrote. I was. I yeah. was a speechwriter um, for for John Podesta at the Center right. for American Progress. After I was an intern on Capitol Hill for a few years, then after I graduated, I moved to D.C. I lived there for for three or four years, and um, I worked at the Center for American Progress, eventually becoming a speechwriter for John, which uh, which was an incredible experience. I was 
terrible at politics, like was not interested in the machinations of politics at all. But but speech writing, I, I loved. I thought it was fascinating. Um, learning how to craft speeches, learning how to craft stories and speeches. Um, I, I still think it's it's one of the things that, you know, I didn't study fiction writing. I, I was not like a creative writing major in, in college. I studied politics. And so I um, I didn't take any writing in college, um, but I eventually went and got my MFA. But I, I credit speech writing as like the thing that got me into fiction writing, because the thing that I loved about speech writing the most was was crafting these stories within you know speeches about like like monetary policy and, you know, and, and like melting ice caps and, you know and so um so I, I i love that so can we talk a little bit about your mfa i don't know if you know this but i got my mfa at nyu too you remember that and i taught there for a semester and okay. i was like you know what I, ca I can't i can't do this i mean you are a beloved teacher and you know how i know that because when wow. I was research researching you, I looked on Rate My Professors. Oh my God, Jillian. <laughs> I know, but can I just read this to you? It's so, it's so right. Amazing professor, super nice guy, makes one of the most boring classes at NYU fun. Super hard grader, but he gives really good feedback. So if you meet him for conferences, your grade will improve. One thing, he, you must go to, always go to class and show up on time. He's fantastic. That's true. I I tell them on the first day of class that the only thing that I'm a real asshole about is being there, like like showing up and showing up on time. And so it speaks so, really well of you. It's like <laughs> you love the work, right? You love to. I, mean, I do not necessarily I the do. teaching, but maybe you do. So here's a question for you: Are you teaching okay. right now? I am teaching right now. Okay, so what's that like? Have they asked about it's, the book? Have they no. asked about Kristen Bell? No, no, they don't even, so it was funny. So last, so, so two funny stories about this. So so this semester I actually had to, you know, I, I, I teach on Wednesdays and I was on Good Morning America last Wednesday. And so I I had to like, I well, I gave an asynchronous assignment that day. Um, we like, you know, I, I there was no class because I couldn't make it to class. And so I, um, and so they were like, well, why don't, why don't we have class? Like, why can't you be here? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going on Good Morning America. They're like, cool, but just to confirm, we don't have class, right? Like we don't have to be here. <laughs> and I'm like, that's correct. And so, and then last semester, the same thing happened. I had to, because of COVID protocols on, protocols on the set, I had to go and like be there for three days before going to the and get tested three times in a row before going to the set. And so I had to miss a day of teaching. And so I, um, I told them, I was like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to visit the set of a movie that's based on my book. And they were like, cool, we don't have class, right? Just to be sure we don't have class. And so <laughs> no, they don't care at all. They just want to make sure they don't have class. Right, day. no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I, I got that. I just think it's so, I, I just think it's so amazing how the self-absorption and it, it honestly, that passage about Joan, you know, the whole, the whole <laughs> yeah. problematic issues. Absolutely. There's a lot of things that are, that are pro problematic, but this was like 70 years ago. Right? I know. I know. Well, it's it's funny that actual that experience of Nick kind of coming up with his Joan Didion essay was actually inspired by a day I had teaching Joan Didion. Where I mean, I, I like love Joan Didion, right? I, I, I like I, I think I've read basically everything she's ever written, except only like half of her novels because I like love her novels. But but like certainly like every essay she's ever written. Right. I know. Yeah, I mean, her novels are like Joan Didion's two three essays. But um, but I. I, so I teach her all of the time and more and more and more, the students are just like really resisting her. Um, and for, for reasons that like when, when they point them out, you're like, oh yeah, like this right. is sort of when she says it on self-respect, you're like, I don't know about that, Joan. Um, and of course, like Joan didn't politics were very complicated for a long time. But, but um, so that was, I was thinking of what Nick should be writing this musical about and was trying to come up with like, you know, you, you walk around Broadway these days and the shows that haven't gotten shut down because of COVID are, you know, the, the, the topics of these musicals. You're like, wait, what? There's a musical, what? And so I was like, it's gotta be something like that. What could it be? What could it be? What could it be? And then I, I landed on Joe Didion after teaching her one day in class 
because I was like, that is just the most unlikely topic for a musical because she's so famously unsentimental and musicals, right. I think just as an art form are incredibly sentimental, right? right? And so I was like, that's a perfect match. It is, it, it is a perfect match. And, and, and you have such a love for your characters. Even the awful ones, you love them. I mean, I mean, and you have to, right? Because you live with them for so long. I mean, yeah, you, that's, go ahead, sorry. No, I mean, it's your show. I mean, I, I, just, I, I, I'm just I think that's something, I, I think that's something that I've had to like, to learn a little bit over, particularly over my last three books that I do love, and, and let's not do that again. Every time I say the, the name, I'm like tempted, I, I feel like I have to like hold it up, you know, I'm like selling yeah. myself. But I, <laughs> but I, that's certainly something that I've had, I, I think I've, I've had to learn more um, is to show the love for the characters on the page yeah. um, because because you're right. I think sometimes I do err on the vicious side, right? And my older books, people, people hated the wedding. I mean, the word hate is in the title. And so I think that, that that's a particularly vicious book and this one is not so vicious, but- um, No, but... this one, I mean, I don't know that it's, I, I, yes, I think that there's a viciousness, but there's also a very deep humanity. I mean, my mother yeah. hates everything, okay? <laughs> and she loved your book. And, and, and it's because you care about the people you're writing about. It's not just to expose their flaws or, but you know, you do it with um, a certain amount of respect. And I think the books that I dislike the most are the ones where uh, authors don't really, they're trying to make a point or mm -hmm. they're trying to show something or show off how smart they are. And you just let people be people. And sometimes people are assholes, but that doesn't mean yeah. that they're bad people, you know? Yeah, and I think that that's something that really interests me um, in this book in particular, that um, the we're all flawed, obviously. And we're all very imperfect when, we, when it comes to loving one another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, families are dysfunctional, families are broken, whatever you want to call them, but, and everyone can be selfish at their own, you know, at their worst moments, but that doesn't absolve us from the obligation of loving one another. Right. And exploring that, like how, how we reckon with our own selfishness and our own desires, how do we reckon with that in the face of this, this, you know, like almost like violent love we have for one another mm -hmm. um, is really interesting to me. And I think his, has, I, it, at least in terms of my writing, has always really interested me. Um, and particularly in this book, when that love requires us to, um, to keep secrets from one another mm -hmm. and to not tell one another certain things, certain truths in order to protect them. In this book, there is a massive truth, or I'm sorry, a massive secret that right. the family has to decide to keep uh, from people they love in order to protect, uh, well, certainly one another, but also kind of like the, the, the fate of, you know, politics in the country. And so um, what are the repercussions of keeping that secret? for themselves, for the country, for the dynamics and the relationships within the family itself. Um, all of that really interests me. Yeah, I think you did it really deftly. I think uh, secrets in, in books are, are very hard because it's, you know, one of the things that I've noticed um, in the, in, in certainly in the past couple of years is that readers are far more savvy than, than, they, than they used to be. I, I really think that there's, I think, readers have more community, mm -hmm. readers have um, a lot more, a lot more say in what gets published now and what yeah. doesn't get published. And I think, you know, readers can see things a mile away and it's, it's, it's really hard to meet out details to know, mm -hmm. you know, how much is too much. And when, you know, like what, when is the powerhouse moment coming? What, I, I think it's hard. I think you did it really well, but I don't think it's easy. So, I mean, well, and, and back to that, I, I, I'm really curious. I mean, you are fair, you know, you're pretty young in, yeah. a, in a good way and you've accomplished <laughs> a lot. I mean, you really have. And 
So no, but you have. It's I'm, it's so impressive. Uh, your, Thank you. Your books have gotten better and better. It's not like you took one book and then wrote the same book four times in a row. I mean, that's you know that's a career path, and and it can be very <laughs> lucrative. I mean, it really can. But yeah. you, it, it's like you, your books have a similar voice because your voice is very distinct. Um, in a good way. I mean, it's wonderful. But your books, you. it's like you've taken on more, um, your your ambitions have gotten, your your stakes have gotten higher. And there's a lot more activity. There's a lot more of a, um, there's a lot more landscape. And it's it's really wonderful to see the progression of your books. And I, you. Are you working on something now? May we ask? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I so I like I've just started it. Like it's in very, very early stages. Um, it's actually um, it's it's still about a family. But it's 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 much different. Um, than than I than than certainly let's not do that again. Um, in that it's entirely in first person. But um, and the uh, oh, you're right. <laughs> so sorry, let's not do that again. Um, and. <laughs> The first person narrator um, in this case is a um, a gay teenager in Laguna Beach in the 1990s. Um, oh, awesome! Yeah, I I grew up in Laguna Beach, obviously in, in, in the 1990s, and uh, I <laughs> uh, so it's very nice to hear that you think I'm young. Uh, but but I you know as you said before, uh, Jillian, I'm I'm really fascinated by place and writing about place and the intersection between place and character, and so I've never written about Laguna Beach before, which is like which is kind of odd to me. I you know I know it so well, and it's it's such kind of an, an interesting place that has its own certain mythologies to it that I'm I'm really interested in unpacking. And I'm really tired of writing about the present. Um, I just I'm like kind of sick of it, and so I'm 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 eager to kind of look back, right? And and also just from like a, a like logistics perspective, it's going to be so nice not to have to deal with like text messages and emails in a novel. Oh, um, you know what I yes. mean? It's just like there's yeah, just going to be a phone, is, and, yeah. and like maybe someone's going to have a pager, but that's it. Um, right. And so, so no, I totally um, get that. My new yeah. book is set in 1968. Oh, love that. Right? Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm kind of working on that. Um, it's, it's same vein in terms of family and it'll be funny, hopefully knock on wood. Um, I have a hard time writing stuff that doesn't air on the side of comedy. Comedy, I think is just how I end up dealing with tragedy. And so, uh, so it'll, it, the voice is sort of there, but um, but it will be in first person. In let's not do that again. The, there's a, of the five acts, one of which the second act is entirely in first person, and writing that um, was was really invigorating for me, um, and super interesting, um, and kind of unlocked something for me. I was like, I you know, oh, I good. I want to I want to try this out. It's hard. It's, I mean, people think, you know, first person is, is first person is hard because you only have it's, one perspective and it is you very can't difficult. know more than the, than the, than the character. Yeah. Yeah. It's really difficult. Um, but like I said, I really, I enjoy placing those limitations on myself yeah. and seeing um, how those limitations end up manifesting different stories. Yeah. And so, uh, so I'm excited. I'm excited to see what happens. Well, we are too. I have yeah. a question about comedy. Sure. So I don't, do you have the experience, if you think something is funny that you write, d reading it, you know, you're going to read your work over and over and over and over. Does it still remain funny? Like, that, do you have that issue of how to keep things fresh, to, even to you? So like, does the same line still still feel like, funny over and over and over again? After like five years of working on the same book, is it still funny? Like, how do you I, know if it's still funny? Yeah, you know, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. I, uh, no, I, um, there are certain, there's stuff gets stale, obviously, right? I mean, you know this, you have to read your book. Like when you go through edits, you have to read your book like so many times. It's a form of torture. Like, you know, yeah. it, I mean, it's just, it's, it's absolutely terrible. 
and stuff gets stale there and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote this, but it's too late now. You know, it's in proofs. You can't change it. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, so, um, but there's, <laughs> I mean, this is going to make me sound like, like I'm so proud of myself, but there are some lines that I like always make me smile up, right? or laugh or crack me up, but they're never the lines that like, crack my husband up they're oh, never no. the lines that like crack other readers up it's always like weird little moments that I find so funny that yeah, you know, you know, know that everyone else is like oh I don't even remember that moment I was like oh really because like I wrote the entire book for that one moment you I know, know? <laughs> I know. So, like I, like there's if I like one line I will cr construct an entire scene just to be able to say it yeah, it's so will I. And it's like real, like, you know, there's the phrase kill your darlings, right? You have to like edit out even the stuff you love. But there are some lines where I'm like, I am not killing this darling. Right. Like, I'm I will right. keep this scene, even if it's to the detriment of the entire book, just to keep this one line. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, I'm the same way. But yeah. um, so, you know what, what's weird is people in the, in the audience, the book process, this, the selling process actually starts six months. It started like six months ago, right? For you. Yeah, 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 probably, yeah. And um, do you feel like it's, you could sort of tell in, the, in those early months, like you get a sense for what the, what's it, it's gonna be like out there. And what I tend to do is if I'm not involved in a new book, like I have to be writing something just to be able to with to tolerate that six month period. And I haven't, I haven't been writing at all. And yeah. I was wondering um, how you're, it, it's, it's hard to see yourself out there, you know? Yeah. I, I, you know what I haven't. So there's this new project of mine that I've, I've started with. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I have maybe I don't know, 20, 30 pages and I, but the last time I touched them was in January. And I, and so I've sort of been putting it off as I've been, you know, ramping up for, for let's not do that again, which, which to your point has kind of been a mistake, right? Because, right. because when you're, when you're really deeply invested in another project, you. It's, it's, it's like a this, buffer. It's a buffer and the stakes suddenly become lower for the project that's art that's coming out. Exactly. Because you're, you're so invested in this new thing. And so it was a mistake, I think, to, to not invest myself fully in <laughs> this new novel, which I'm tentatively calling Beefcake, um, nice. uh, before, <laughs> before this book came out. Uh, I think I would, you know, I would have, at this point, I would be really appreciating that distraction. Yeah, for sure. no, I know. Because um, I, I have two paragraphs, but I have like, I know how it's, I have the architecture. And for me, right. having the architecture is really significant because I have a job job, a regular, like a, right. nor a normal person job. So, right. so I have to be able to do the big thinking at times where I have more back-to-back -back days so that when yeah. I go to back to my job, I only have to focus on like the scenes and stuff. And yeah. I know we're there. So I, yeah. I'm... I'm, I'm like, okay, you know what you have to do. Because you don't do it for the now you, you do it for the later you. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, I mean, look, it's a terrible job we've, we've picked for ourselves, isn't it? <laughs> it's writing yeah. business. But, you know, I, I, I can't imagine, I, I mean, I really, 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 I, I can't tolerate it. I can't, but I can't imagine doing anything else. Like, what? Well, I know. You know what I, I mean? Know. Like to not do it isn't really an option. And yeah. yeah. And that sounds to me very pretentious. At the same time, I've been doing it now for a really long time. So I'm not just making that up. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> like if I really want to, do you really think I want to live like this? You know? I know. I know. Well, it's also one of those things where I'm like, this seems to be the only thing that I'm like kind of okay at, right? Like I like I like I get like I I don't I you know I like like I, I I can't do math. I look at a fraction and like break out in hives. I know nothing about science, right? But but words, I'm like yeah, okay, yeah, sure. I'm certainly not rational enough to be a lawyer, and so so that kind of you know whittles it down here. Right. Um, and you want to get paid. And you want to get paid, right? So um, but. 
but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a roller coaster of emotions. I will say that releasing a book, but I'm, I am very, very happy and proud that this one is out in the world. Well, you should be, you have really accomplished. I mean, it's, it's really masterful the way that honestly, on a micro level, when you're reading it, and then when you step back and you see the whole thing come together, it's beautiful. And and I, I, I'm so excited for you because you have, you know, I, I feel like you have that hunger that you want to get, you want to get better, you want to do the next thing, you're not locked into this trope of like, you know, that just keeps recurring, you know, the same book over and over, you're doing something different, and you're taking on new stuff. And and that doesn't necessarily mean that your career is going to go like the way of James Patterson. And so you have to, you know, you have, but you have to find things about the book yeah. that you love to keep yeah. you. So how do you do that? Do you like, one of the things I do is if I'm writing really well, I'll sometimes stop to make myself want to go back. Yeah. I do the exact same thing. I, if a scene is going really well, I won't finish it. I'll right. I'll keep it open so I know that I get to get to go back to it. Um, another thing that actually really helps me, and I don't know if, if if this helps you or if there are other writers here that they've tried this, but I um I'll email myself pages that I've written and I'll read them actually on my phone. Um, when you read them on your phone, it like there aren't it doesn't look like Microsoft Word, you know, it's just kind of like this blank screen, and there's something about it of not seeing it and just like Microsoft Word again, where it it kind of shakes something, yeah. you know, and I'm able to see it in a new light and get excited about it in a new way. And I'm able to kind of more imagine it as an actual book, um, as opposed to just these like, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of manuscript pages that I'm trying to figure out what to do with. And yeah. so I try that and it's it's actually um it actually ends up being pretty helpful. Oh good. I'll try that too. I just I, I feel like when I finished this my book and turned it in, I'm like, I'm never writing again. Do you ever go oh, through yeah. that? Like, I'm never doing oh, this again. Oh yeah, I go through it every day. Yeah. You know, I, I, I even said to my my agent last week, I was in a bad place. I said, Would you be mad if <laughs> <laughs> you know? Always start, how mad would you be if I just said, Look, I'll pay back the money. Let's pull yeah. it now. I, yeah. I just don't think I can tolerate. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, She's I mean, like, I think about that no. daily, yeah. daily, you know, yeah, we'll pull it back, not do it, right? <laughs> but then it pulls you back. I mean, it, um, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's. I, I think that we're also very lucky to be able to do this. And, and um, I feel very fortunate to be able to do it. Too. Yes, I know, I do too. And I, I, I you see, um, do you, when you, do you, you, do you teach fiction? I when don't, teach I teach essay writing. Um, oh, okay. Which actually is great. It 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 kind of it uses a different part of my brain, which is really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, but no, I, I teach essay writing, and I've been doing it for ten years now. Right. Well, you, it, I mean, you're you're very good at, it. and I, it <laughs> absolutely informs your fiction. It does. Yes. Absolutely. You know, you've read books by that there's no structure. It's just mm -hmm. like kind of, and it's like there's no bird's eye view like some they're not mm -hmm. they're not looking at it from a, a structural vantage point but um i when i taught i taught freshmen fre com, uh, freshman um fiction mm -hmm. and it was a cross section and there was like we're, I, we we did this whole thing about point of view and so i said write a scene from uh, from the first person point of view right that's the yeah. I point of view. And then we're going to do the same scene, but from a third person point of view. So the the kid did like a search and find. So it, uh -huh. you know, it just <laughs> took out the I and the, and put in she. He didn't even change the tense. Yeah, that's how it works. Right. Uh. But I thought it was so funny. I, I, you know, that's the kind of thing that just like cracked me up and I just I just lit, dined off that for 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 weeks I just thought it was so funny that's amazing right that's amazing. I know. Yeah. yeah yeah I'm so tempted to just let you keep going because it's the, the most freewheeling and fun conversation I think we've had on on zoom and <laughs> an age 
and <laughs> we've been through an age, I suppose, <laughs> on Zoom, yeah, yeah. Uh, doing these events on Zoom. But um, we're we're at the top of the hour, so um, I I want to be able to to let you go back to 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 dinner and to more, hopefully more Negronis and and yeah. um, cheers. Yes, I you've inspired <laughs> me, Grant. Uh, but uh, Grant, Jillian, thank you so much for joining us uh, at Home with Literati thank this you, evening. Bob. Um, oh, it's our pleasure. And hopefully we'll have you in the store, uh, physically in the store for your next books. Uh, but until then, we hope you continue to be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Jillian.